Tonight we're talking about the history of Christian anti-Semitism, part two, the last 500 years of Jewish history vis-a-vis the anti-Semitism that we have unfortunately suffered as a result of the Christians in primarily Christian Europe. Now, before we begin, a few important caveats. Like I mentioned last time, this is a shortened, truncated, highly abridged version of the last 500 years of Christian anti-Semitism. If we wanted to tell the whole detail, we'd have to be here significantly longer. Additionally, there are many facets of the issue that we will not even discuss at all. Of course, there's other bigger geopolitical seismic changes that really have changed the nature of the Christian world. And as a result, Christian relations with Jews over the past two, three, four hundred years, uh, there's been the Reformation, which we will talk about a little bit. But more broadly speaking, there's been the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and the world has changed a lot. And that, of course, has affected Christian anti-Semitism. So it's not going to be in a complete um, version of the history. Uh, Another reason why this is an imperfect study, because it's very unpleasant. And I, I found this when I was researching the subject, that some of the descriptions are, are, are nauseating. They're, they're macabre. They're ghastly. You don't want to read them. You don't want to recount them. You don't want to talk about it. It's not, it's not pleasant conversation. Uh, and I think it's important for us to understand the reason why we're doing this. Firstly, I think it's important for us to know our history. And it's very easy for people to have a very narrow frame of vision, see their world, their community, their neighborhood, and that guides their perspectives on any multitude of issues. History expands our perspective, lets us see the past and different societies and different cultures and different attitudes, and it's a much more informative perspective that we could create as a result. So I think it's important to learn the past. But I also think that a lot of people are not aware of that there's a quite pernicious form of Christian anti-Semitism that continues today in an entirely different dimension, but it's rooted in the same undergirding principles that caused the more violent anti-Semitism of the past. And when you see this shift in behavior, you have to ask yourself the question, why did behavior change? When you see a thousand years in different countries, in different societies, in one mode of behavior, and then a dramatic shift, the question is, why, what changed? And it's clear, and I'm going to try to demonstrate it, is that the core roots of the hatred didn't change. It's just that the application of it had to be adjusted due to circumstances. So let's pick up with the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition uh, upended 600 years of Jewish life in Spain, and the Jews were given the option, you stay and convert, or you leave and flee and abandon your homeland, the place you've been living for hundreds of years. Uh, Many Jews chose the former, many Jews chose the latter, and it's important for us to realize the story continues beyond 1492, everywhere the Jews lived under the Spanish sort of empire, imperialist empire, the Inquisition followed them. So they could have moved uh, to, to Mexico and have the Spanish Inquisition coming after them there. If someone converted to Christianity and then wanted to secretly still behave as a Jew, their life was made very difficult by the Spanish Inquisition. And the life was difficult as well for the Jews that left. They went, a lot of them went to Portugal. Initially, uh, many went to Turkey. The ones that went to Turkey actually fared the best, living under the Ottoman Empire in its ascendancy and essentially living with moderate Muslims was a lot better than any variety of Christians uh, for most recent 500 years, broadly speaking. And Jews went to, to Greece and Italy. Jews essentially went everywhere fleeing from Spain. Many of them went to uh, Northern Europe, uh, Amsterdam, Denmark. These places became very uh, populated with Spanish uh, emigrants. I want to talk about these various places one after the other, kind of just give a 
a survey of the history of Jews living under these Christian rule. So in 1496 and 1497, Portugal adopted its neighbor's policies towards the Jews and gave them the same essential two options. You either convert or you leave. They were more forthright with their ambitions. They, for example, forcibly baptized children. They kidnapped children. Many Jews then became conversos in Portugal. The ones that were told that they should have to flee if they don't want to convert. They tried to flee. They were kept in there. It was a really bizarre, like, 10 years or so, where the Jews were told, you either have to convert or leave. You try to leave, you can't leave. And they got to the port where all the ships were supposed to take them to, who knows where, to the abyss. And they sat them all down and gave them lectures why they all should become Christians. In 1506, a terrible and vicious pogrom erupted in Lisbon, known as the Lisbon Pogrom, or Lisbon Massacres. Uh, the story goes that one of the new Christians, one of the conversos, uh, he was in church along with other Christians. And one of the people there, he swore with 100% certainty that he saw an image of J.C. on the altar. And this Jew, this converso, or this new Christian, as they were called, he kind of told him, eh, it was probably just the reflection of the candles. You just saw it. It wasn't real. So they said, this is the absolute heresy. What do you mean? The guy saw J.C. and now you're saying it's not true. They quickly grabbed that converso, they beat him to death, and then the mob, spurred on by some local priests who said anyone who participates in these purging of the heretics is going to have all the sins of the past hundred days expunged, that created this frenzied mob that started attacking Jews uh, throughout the whole city after an entire week of slaughter more than a 1,000 Jews were brutally killed. The numbers vary. Uh, the minimum number that I saw was a 1,000. And as characteristic with some of these mobs, they didn't spare anyone, not pregnant women, not babies, not infants, nobody. Uh, after that episode, the horrific, uh, considered one of the first pogroms, really, this spontaneous outbreak of Jew ha hatred, which is not really spontaneous because people don't spontaneously start to decide to go murder their neighbors. Um, but that is going to become a pattern of the, the next 500 years. After this horrific event, the Jews were allowed to leave Portugal and thousands of them did. One of the eyewitnesses to this massacre was someone by the name of Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Verga. And he went on to write a book called the Shevet Yehuda. It's essentially a history book delineating the 64 major persecutions that the Jews faced from the time of the destruction of the Second Temple until present day. Uh, the Jews who decided to stay in Portugal, they had to face the very harsh Portuguese Inquisition over the course of its duration and its rule. More than a thousand people were publicly burned in the auto de fe where they would just... this act of faith and burn someone for being a secret Jew. Now, the Jews in Italy didn't fare much better. Uh, Italy had its own strain, its own strand of anti-Semitism. In Venice in 1516, a new method of dealing with Jews was tested and perfected and then proliferated elsewhere, and that's the ghetto. The Jews were collected from all over the city, moved to a small, isolated, walled-off part of the town, and forced to live there, and not allowed to leave, or allowed to leave uh, under very strict conditions. And that's where the Jews lived, in squalor, in deplorable, and horrifically cramped conditions. This tremendous innovation saved the church rulers from the terrible hassle of having to expel the Jews. It causes a lot of problems. There's a lot of logistics. Just put them all in a box and shut the box and let them suffer there. Uh, this gained widespread popularity. In 1555, the famed Roman ghetto was established under the rule, under the direct edict of Pope Paul IV. They took the most undesirable part of the city, 
uh, on the banks of the river, the place that's most likely to flood, and they made the Jewish ghetto over there. And indeed, he ordered that they build these massive walls around uh, around the ghetto, cordoning off from the rest of the town. Well, who's going to pay for that construction? The Jews. So to add insult to injury, you're going to have to be li- be forced to live in isolation, away from everyone else, and uh, away from the economic economic opportunities of the town, and you'll have to pay for your own misfortune. And the conditions in these ghettos were abominable. You couldn't expand horizontally, so all the buildings were built vertically, causing tremendous overcrowding, and it was very dark and dank because the sun couldn't reach. It was very narrow, uh, narrow pathways between buildings, and it's all very dark and full of uh, just decrepit and decay. And one of the rules of this particular edict of the Pope was that Jews don't need more than one synagogue per city or region. We know today Jews need to have at least two synagogues, one they go to, one they don't go to, right? Uh, But the Pope says, why do Jews need to have more than one place of worship? One's sufficient. All the other ones should get destroyed. So in Rome alone, seven extra synagogues were destroyed. Jews were forced, as they've been many times uh, beforehand and many times since, to wear funny clothing, distinctive yellow hats in this variety. Jews were not allowed to own property or practice medicine on Christians. Jews were barred from many occupations, were allowed only unskilled jobs, to sell rags, to sell secondhand clothes, to be fishmongers, to be pawn brokers. Additionally, for the right and the privilege to be allowed to stay in the ghetto, they had to pay a yearly tax, and every year they would have to go and salute the Pope near the Arch of Titus, of course, the monument to the first downfall, um, or to the downfall of Jerusalem thousands of years prior. And every Saturday, Jews were forced to hear compuls- compulsory sermons in front of the church just outside of the wall. In that same year, 1555, in Ancona, the Pope ordered all the Jews who were not willing to be baptized rounded up. Around 60 Jews, unfortunately, became converted. 24 of them refused to do so and were savagely hanged and then burned. And this kicked off one of the first uh, events of Jews trying to fight back in Jewish history, Jews worldwide were so horrified by what happened in Ancona, they mounted a boycott of all merchandise coming from Ancona, and they briefly managed to shut down that port city, although it didn't really succeed because the Jews themselves were divided whether or not to support it, and indeed many of those that suffered were the Jews themselves, and ultimately this boycott foundered. This particularly rabid anti-Semitic pope was followed and succeeded by two more of his ilk, Pope Pius IV and the Fifth. They continued the process of ghettoization and the continued marginalizations of the Jews in Italy and the world over. Now, these pope-imposed requirements for Jews to live in the ghettos, that was present and active from the middle of the 16th century till the 19th century almost modern times. Now, in the beginning of the 16th century, there was a new strain of Christian anti-Semitism, namely the Protestant Reformation. It was a reform for a lot of things, but one thing it was clearly not a reform uh, for was Jew hatred. Martin Luther, the founder of the Reformation, he initially tried to court the Jews He pointed out all the corruption that existed in the church. And he said, well, the only thing stopping the Jews from joining is the corruption. Get rid of the corruption. And of course, they'll flock aboard. A calculation made by Muhammad, or similar calculation made by Muhammad, about a thousand years earlier. Now, the Jews, of course, rebuffed his overtures. Our resistance to Christianity has nothing to do with their corruption has to do with we don't believe their nonsense. And 
that transformed Martin Luther into one of the most virulent anti-Semites of all time. You wrote a whole book about it. If you want to read this book, just, just to gain his sense on the quote, the name of the book, the title of the book maybe gives away his perspective on the Jews and their lies. Some choice quotes. Jews are a base, whoring people, not a people of God. Jews are full of the devil's feces, which they wallow in like swine. And in his book, he outlines his perspective of what should happen. What should the, what should the Christians do with the Jews? And he gives a few suggestions. Number one, burn down all the synagogues and schools and warn people about that, about them. Don't allow the Jews to own houses next to Christians. All Jewish writings should be confiscated. Forbid rabbis from preaching or teaching. Jews should be not granted any protection in the highways. Uh, Jews not be allowed to partake in lending money, which was a big Jewish business. And also force Jews to engage in menial and degrading labor. Now, Martin Luther was indeed a great hero to one of his spiritual heirs, and that's Hitler. And indeed, Kristallnacht was done on Martin Luther's birthday and in honor and recognition of, of, of one of the early anti-Semites. And the Nazi Julius Streicher, who was their head of propaganda in Nuremberg, he defended his propaganda by saying that everything that he said was said much earlier by Martin Luther. And if you're judging him for what he says, you have to bring Martin Luther back and judge him alongside them. And indeed, in recent times, the Protestants and the Lutherans, they had to disavow Martin Luther's anti-Semitism because it became unpalatable. What were the Jews in Poland and the Ukraine? In the 16th century, Poland became the largest Jewish population center in the world. And for a significant amount of time, Jews actually did very well there. They flourished. And also, in a dramatic departure for the way the Jews have been living in recent times, at least recent from from their perspective, Jews were granted a certain degree of autonomy. Jews were allowed by their overlords to establish what's known as the Vad Arba Harotzos, the Council of Four Lands, formerly recognized by the authorities. These were the official representations of the Jews and were given broad freedoms to legislate, to uh, administrate, to oversee the Jews in many different manners, in judicial and spiritual manners. And this body was in existence, meeting twice annually for two centuries. Pretty pretty remarkable. And in Poland, the Jews established their farm communities, their little shtetls, where they lived in peace and harmony, and indeed, in relative prosperity. Jews did fairly well, as they always do, when they're granted a little bit of leverage to act as, uh, uh, as they seek and as they choose. Now, of course, there were occasional pogroms and occasional outbreaks of violence, but nothing really earth-shattering. And that, of course, changed in the middle of the 17th century. Now, Catholic Poland had occupied Eastern Orthodox Ukraine at the time, and for several decades the Ukrainians tried to mount revolts to unseat the Polish. Now, the fact that the Jews were kind of friendly or were, 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 had positions of authority in the, Polish war, in the Polish world as administrators and as tax collectors did not help to endear them upon the Ukrainians who looked at them as being an extension of the Poles. They felt that they were being mistreated by the Poles and they conflated the Jews and the Poles together. But the early Ukrainian, the early Cossack, as they're called, uprisings during the 16th and early 17th century were directed where the Ukrainians were fighting the Poles, the Eastern Orthodox Christians against the Catholics. 
1637, the Pavel Yurk uprising, it started to encroach upon the Jews. It resulted in the unfortunate murder of 200 Jews, mainly tax collectors, leaseholders, and they also destroyed many shuls. Now, this uprising was not successful. The leader, Pavel Yurk, was brought to Warsaw. He was tried. He was executed. Uh, the Cossacks rebelled again in that spring of 16, uh, 1637. Again, it was unsuccessful. Another rebellion the following year in 1638 was also drowned out. But there was the terrible revolt, an uprising, the Khmelnytsky uprising of 1648 that ultimately led to the creation of the state for the Cossacks in the Ukraine and caused tremendous damage to the Jews of Ukraine, Lithuania, and Poland. This monster, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, managed to unite some of the warring factions of the Ukrainian populace. He got some Turks as well to join aboard. And his rebellion gained steam as it swept through the region. Within a few months, the many of the Polish nobles and officials and priests were killed by these Cossacks and swept out of the land. But no one suffered over this whole ordeal more than the Jews. Uh, Chmelnitsky seemed to have had a pathological, deep-seated hatred of the Jews that rivaled Hitler's. And their solution of how to deal with the problem was the same. Namely, wholesale, brutal genocide. As they rampaged through Poland and the Ukraine, they slaughtered countless Jewish towns. Now, important to note here, it wasn't just the Cossacks. The Poles themselves were oftentimes complicit in assisting the Cossacks with their genocide. Indeed, centuries later, Polish-born Menachem Begin commented, quote, Poles are deeply anti-Semitic. They drink it in their mother's milk. So the Poles themselves are not free of any guilt. But over the course of this rebellion, there's thousands of Jewish communities that are totally massacred. For example, the city of Tolchin. There were about 400 Polish soldiers and 200 Jews who had taken refuge in the fortress of the town. And the Cossacks, they call out to the Poles and they tell them, we have nothing against you. Only one is the Jews, the accursed Jews that you have there. So the Poles decided to open the, open the gates. Once... They open the gates, the Cossacks round up all the Jews and say, okay, what do you want? Baptiz baptism? Convert to Eastern Orthodox Christianity? Or we will kill you. And indeed, many thousands, well, in that town, for example, uh, hundreds, were tortured and killed and died al Kiddush Hashem in martyrdom. Ten great rabbis of the town were taken by the Cossacks in order to extort ransoms from the communities. And then, once the Cossacks were finished with the Jews, for good measure, they turned to the Poles and killed all the Poles as well. Uh, in the city of Nemirov, there were 6,000 Jews that had taken refuge in the fortified fortress of the town, locked the gates. The Cossacks started to impersonate the Poles. They took the Polish flags and said, oh, we're, we're, we're a bunch of Poles, we're here to save you. We're trying to defend against the Cossacks. They deceived them, eventually opened up the gate. Once they allowed in, they started cutting down and murdering the men, women, and children. No mercy. Many of the women, they committed suicide, jumping into the moat surrounding the castle in order to kill themselves rather than be captured alive. Young men tried to swim away. Those were pursued and hunted down and killed as well. And we're told by eyewitnesses that the moat of the town became blood red from all the blood uh, of these savages. Now, there's a contemporaneous account that's a little bit uh, stomach churning, but it's important for us to know uh, to what depths uh, human cruelty can fall and what sadness 
and cruelty our ancestors had experienced during this time. This is a direct quote. Some of the Jews had their skins flayed off of them and their flesh thrown to the dogs. Their hands and feet of others were cut off and flung into the roadway. Many were burned alive. Children were slaughtered in their mother's bosoms, and many children were torn apart like fish. They ripped up the bellies of pregnant women, took out the unborn child, and flung them in the faces of their parents. They tore open the bellies of others, placed cats, living cats, into them, and sewed them back up, and then cut off their hands so they can't try to do anything about that. Uh, and to hear the last line here, there was never an unnatural death in the world that they did not inflict upon their victims. In other sources, we're told some of the gruesome ways that they killed the defenseless Jews. They drowned them. They butchered them with knives. They roasted children to death while forcing their parents to consume their remains and then killing them as well. People were hoarded into shuls that were set aflame. People, of course, skinned alive, like we mentioned. Really horrific and gruesome and grisly torture. That's... You know, we don't even imagine that someone could sink that low. Within six months, more than 100,000 Jews of the region were killed. Hundreds of communities ravaged. Those that survived were sold as slaves, many of them in Constantinople with the Turks were. Uh, again, those that ended up under the rule, under the thumb of the Muslims fared much better than those killed by the Christians. There's many stories of heroism and martyrdom that emerge from, the, from this episode. I'll give you two quick ones here. Um, a Cossack, he seized a Jewish, beautiful Jewish girl, and he was going to marry her. And this girl wanted nothing of it. So she tells him that she has some sort of magical powers no weapon could hurt her. And she tells this Cossack, if you don't believe me, just test me. Take your gun, point it at me, and shoot him. Won't even, it won't even hurt me at all. So her new husband's like, well, I'll, I'll try this out. And he takes the gun, and he shoots her, and he kills her, but she preferred that than to be with such an animal. A uh, similar story, a Cossack butchered two parents and captured their daughter with the intention of marrying her, she tells him she wants to marry him in one of the Christian churches that is has these high towers and she, when she gets to the top, jumps off and commits suicide. Many, many stories of that ilk emerge from this Horrific episode. Now, in Ukraine, Khmelnytsky is considered a national hero. There's a huge monument in Kiev uh, of him. He, there's a city named after him, a region named after him. His face adorns Ukrainian money. And indeed, one of the highest honors is the Order of Bardan Khmelnytsky that was given out in Ukraine and the former. Soviet Union. I was thinking, you know, when that whole brouhaha of Russia, when they annexed Crimea, which is the place where a lot of these animals came from, I couldn't help but feel that these people had it coming. They deserve every bit of it and a lot more. In the aftermath of this horrific tragedy, considered by many to be the first or an earlier Holocaust, there was fast days enacted. There's many uh, keynote that we say. Uh, throughout the year to memorialize this tragedy, some of them going as far as comparing this tragic episode to the destruction of the temple itself. Now, the Jews in Russia were not allowed to live there between the 15th and 17th century, very sparsely populated during that time. And as the Russian Empire grew, they found a lot of Jews now living under their rule. 
they established the world's largest ghetto. Uh, essentially, it's a, uh, it was a country. They called it the Pale of the Settlement, established in 1791. And uh, unless Jews converted to Eastern Orthodoxy, the state religion, they were forced to live in this place. Essentially, 100,000 Jews were uprooted from their towns and from their homes and forced to become refugees, move into some other place. It, of course, prevented the Jews from advancing economically. The Jews couldn't live in certain cities unless they were uh, part of, uh, unless they were granted a waiver. And, of course, once the Jews are all coalesced in one venue, they become easy targets for pogroms. Now, there is a silver lining to this pale of settlement in the fact that the Jews actually managed to flourish spiritually because oftentimes when we suffer physically, we're able to concentrate our efforts on the physical aspects of being a Jew and to grow. So you have the founding of the yeshiva movement, for example. Yeshiva start to crop up all over this region. You have the Jews doing uh, the Hasidic movement also uh, really burgeoning during this time. Uh, but Jews suffer tremendously in, in the under the Russian Empire. For example, in 1827, Jew young boy, young Jewish boys, as young as 12, were forced to go into military service with the intention of integrating them into Russian society, which is another way of saying of converting them uh, away from the religion of their antecedents to become Christians. And the way they did it was particularly uh, heinous. They would tell every community, you have to give us a quota of young boys to join the army. And that essentially meant the end of someone's Jewish life. It was impossible for someone to maintain their Jewish identity under those conditions. And by the time they got out of it, they'll be in their 30s and it's hopeless to recapture, uh, bring them back to the Jewish uh, fold. And then they would tell the Jewish communities, you have to give me a certain amount of people. I don't care how you get it. And then what happens? It caused tremendous internal strife where people are trying to bribe the officials to save their own kids. Uh, during this time, some parents actually chose to cut off the trigger finger of their young sons to make them invalids and thus to save them from conscription which is a horrific decision, but you can understand the rationale for making that. Uh, but additionally, in Russia, they the Jews suffered because of ongoing pogroms. In fact, the term pogrom was actually um, specifically referring to events that happened in the end of the 19th and early 20th century in Russia later, of course, was expanded to include any outbreak of violence against Jews. In the early 1880s, we see in America, for example, wide-scale Russian Jews emigrating to the United States. Well, why did Jews in the 1880s suddenly decide to come to the United States? Because during the early 1880s, there was hundreds of pogroms all across Russia. The Jews said, well, they're fed up with it. We want to leave. And they left the place they've been living for hundreds of years and moved to the United States. In 1903 to 1906, a bloodier wave of pogroms erupted. And at the end of the 1910s, even after the Bolsheviks arrived, there were certain parts of the Ukraine that were not part of the Red Russia. And there were massive pogroms there as well. Just a quick, quick retelling of the famous Kishinev pogroms. In Kishinev, there were anti-Semitic newspapers that would publish headlines such as Death to the Jews or Crusade Against the Hated Race. Anti-Semites today are a little bit more tactful, I would say. And what happened was there was a Christian boy who was found murdered and a Christian girl who committed suicide but ended up dead in a Jewish hospital. And this anti-Semitic newspaper insinuated 
that both children were murdered for the purpose of using their blood to prepare matzah for Pesach. And during the church services on Easter Sunday, the priests go to the Jews to partake in a pogrom in Kishinev. And two days of rioting resulted in about 50 deaths and many hundreds wounded and houses destroyed and stores pillaged. There's a remarkable quote here from April 28, 1903 from the New York Times. This is the New York Times. This is, this is, this is the 20th century uh, describing the first Kishinev pogrom. And this is a direct quote. The anti-Jewish riots in Kishinev are worse than the censor will permit to publish. There was a well-laid-out plan for the general massacre of the Jews on the day following the Orthodox Easter. The mob was led by priests, and the general cry, Kill the Jews, was taken up all over the city. The Jews were taken wholly unaware and were slaughtered like sheep. The dead number, 120, and the injured, about 500. So that's actually incorrect. The dead was only around 49 or 50, depends on what, upon which account. Back to the times. The scenes of horror attending this massacre are beyond description. Babies were literally torn to pieces by the frenzied mob and bloodthirsty mob. The local police made no attempt to check the reign of terror. At sunset, the street were piled with corpses and wounded. Those who could make their escape fled in terror, and the city is now practically deserted of Jews. Over the course of this about 40-year reign of pogroms, there were earlier ones as well, but this concentrated outbreak of pogroms, there were literally hundreds of examples of these outbreaks of violence against the Jews. Now, of course, the most horrific genocide in all of human history was the Holocaust. There's been many books written about the church's role in actively or passively contributing to this terrible genocide. Um, what's clear is that they didn't do a lot to try to stop it. And like we mentioned earlier, it contributed to their underlying cause. We spoke about this earlier last time, that the continued existence and endurance and flourishing of the Jews creates a core philosophical, theological problem for Christians. If they are here to replace us, our role is just to... We're merely the opening act for the Christians. We should have disappeared after they arrived to the scene. Uh, and like we saw last time, they came up uh, very early on with the ideas that we're here to testify what happens when people reject the J.C., and thus, us suffering in various different places actually emboldens their claim to the superiority and veracity of their religion and the inferiority of ours. So it's, is it a shock when the Holocaust happens and it dovetails beautifully with their perspective? Should they, is it a shock that they don't make a huge Protest against it? Of course not. Now, after the war, we know that there were thousands of kids that were given off to uh, to churches and seminaries by Jewish parents who wanted them to not go to the concentration and death camps. And we know that after the war, the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Herzog, he approached the Pope and asked him to get those Jewish children back. And the Pope asked for a list of all the known children that were given away to Christian families and Christian churches and monasteries. After that list was given over, these kids disappeared without a trace. No one knows where they were, and none of them were returned. It's amazing how such behavior is acceptable in the Christian world even after the Holocaust. We know that many trains full of survivors 
who had lost everything. They arrived to various places in the world, for example, to Sweden. And a progressive and Protestant country, and the priests did everything they can to try to get them to convert to Christianity. Uh, the Jews, in even after the Holocaust, were forced to listen to sermons from priests to try to bring them close to Christianity. So it's a pretty shameful legacy. Now, I want to talk about modern times in the United States and in Israel. We know that in Israel, there's a huge effort, millions of dollars spent by missionaries trying to teach Christianity to mostly less educated and poorer Jews. Then the question is, of course, why would they spend so much money and such efforts to teach Jews about Christianity where they could go to the jungles of Africa and have a lot more eager adherence? And the methods that they use don't seem to be very evil at all. They're very kind, they're very caring, they reach out to poor people, to immigrants, people that are less fortunate. They invite them over and they give them gifts and they really try to bring them close to them, to show them a lot of love, but all as a pretense to bring them closer to Christianity. The question is, why? Well, why are they investing so much in the Jews? So again, going back to where we started, the Christians are almost mandated to be anti-Semitic. The function of the Jews is just to serve a testimony regarding what happens when a nation rejects JC and to prove the veracity of their religion. Well, what do you have? The Holocaust. The Holocaust seems to be the greatest evidence. But after the Holocaust, there's a tremendous rebirth of the Jewish people, the establishment of the Jewish state, and these are death blows to Christian ideology. Where's the witness? You have a Jewish nation left for the dead, and they have arisen anew. They're winning wars. They establish a dynamic economic and military superpower. This contradicts the central tenet of the Christian doctrine. And they redirected their focus. They became obsessed with corrupting Israel from within to spew their venom, so to speak, in a friendlier way and to get Israel to turn it Christian. But what's important for us to realize here is that the underlying motivation is the same. Uh, It's just that, and that is to address the core philosophical perspective from a Christian viewpoint. Initially, their solution is, let's make the Jews suffer. When that becomes untenable, well, then go back to their other focus, try to get the Jews to convert. I think in America today, it's, people don't speak about this enough in my assessment, there's these messianic, quote-unquote, Jews who are just Christians, motivated by the same core belief of the same Christians who slaughtered millions of Jews throughout history, and they're trying to make believe that Christianity and Judaism is one is the same. So, so it's all the same. We, and, and us Jews should embrace it. And that's shameful and it's astounding. you know. And their efforts are incredible what they're trying to do. You know, um, I am very interested in the idea of using podcasts to teach Torah and to spread Judaism. But if you go to iTunes and you look on the top categories of podcasts under Judaism, there is an insane amount of Christians and Christianity that are under the pretense of Jewry. They're masquerading as Jews. It's just trying to promote the same JC and Christian nonsense. And they're coming to the Jewish section, and ostensibly they're Jewish, so they're, they're, they're presenting themselves as being Jewish, all with the same evidence. It's, a, it's the same Christian anti-Semitism, it's just not violent, but the underlying rationale for it is the same. And of course, there's many, many fake shuls out there. Shuls that are bedecked with Jewish logos, 
with stars of David, with Hebrew letters, with Hebrew names. And they're nothing but churches masquerading as shuls. And their objective is the same. It's the same hateful objective. It's a rejection of the idea that Jews and Judaism can continue to exist. That's the underlying rationale for all Christian anti-Semitism. According to them, we are not allowed to continue to exist because we were replaced. And thus, how do you change it? In today's climate, how do you try to affect that same result? You no longer can have pogroms, thankfully, or at least in the immediate future, it doesn't seem like that's a viable option. Well, change it from within. Invest in, Jewify your Christian outreach, and maybe that will be successful. I think in conclusion, we could say that history is abundantly clear. The religion that professes to be a religion of love is actually one of vile, venomous hatred, one that does not allow or does not see a world where Jewry can exist. And our response to them is we are absolutely and abundantly proud of our Judaism. We will always reject and repudiate their nonsensical beliefs. We will never accept them. We will remember what their people have done to ours. We will not forget our history. And we will await the real Mashiach. May he come speedily in our days. I look forward to seeing everyone after Pesach in three weeks. Everyone have a lovely, happy Pesach. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time.